everybody, Scout Crafty here again, TGIF, thank God it's Friday, you made it through another week, and let's, uh, we got a, a quick video today, we we'll try and clear up and wrap up a few things from earlier this week, um, but first of all, the first thing I want to talk about is, uh, one of the things when I was in Scouts, well, you know, we always had to have things to entertain the boys, and one of the things I came up with was called the Mammoth Tree Contest. Now, the Mammoth Tree Contest was meant to get the boys out of the house when we, uh, in between meetings and whatnot, so that they can uh, do some hiking around town and whatnot. And uh, the idea of the contest was they had to find the biggest tree in our town. And um, now, what happens is, when I say biggest tree, there's two ways to measure. You can measure the, uh, the girth or, or thickness of the trunk, and you can measure the height of the tree. Now, because we're in such close proximity to buildings and stuff, uh, it was difficult to find the actual height of trees for the boys because we use uh, field expedient methods like uh, the felling method or the uh, uh, shadow method. There's a bunch of ways we can find out how tall a tree is in the field, but in the city, it's a little difficult. You got buildings and everything around. So I kept it to find how the thickest circumference trunk of a tree, and we would call that the mammoth tree. Now, um, the first year we did it, I happened to find the biggest tree that in our town, and uh, I used that as an example to show the boys, and then they could go around and try and find the next biggest size. They couldn't use that one because that's obviously the biggest tree. So I wanted to show you um, this tree. Uh, I'm going to take you down the park. Um, uh, to measure the uh, circumference of a tree, you basically go about four and a half, uh, they say breast height, but uh, it's all different depending on how tall you are. But it's uh, in the United States, we go four and a half feet from the ground up the trunk and measure it around that way. And uh, that's how you could tell the circumference of a tree. So let's go down the park and check it out. Okay, so I'm taking a little hike down the park, wearing my adventure team hat, thanks to Ramel. Really appreciate it. But I'm down the park here. I'm, tell you, I'm amazed at how many people are wearing masks. They're by themselves, 100 feet away from anybody else, still wearing a mask. Don't make sense to me, I don't understand it. Anyway, I wanna show you the, uh, I want to show you that tree. Let's take a look at it now. Okay, and here she is. This is the mammoth tree. I can't even can't even explain how big this tree is, but uh, it loses uh, sight, especially when you're looking at it through video. But let me show you the girth of this tree, so you can really appreciate. Okay, it. here we are. Uh, I only wish I knew how old this tree was. Look at that. What a beauty, huh? Okay, so let's uh, let's take a uh, reading of how wide this tree is. Now to measure the tree, what we'll do is we put a small nail in here in the bark, and believe me, a small nail will not damage any of the tree, but small little nail that only goes in about three-eighths of an inch. We'll take a loop of rope and we'll wrap it around the tree and uh, use that rope okay, to so measure. Now you can see we have the twine wrapped all the way around the tree, and it's coming from the other side here. And then we just wrap it once again around that nail, and then we're going to make a little knot right here, right here, and that's how we'll measure it. So we'll make a little knot There's right the knot in the rope, and you can see it lines up right with the nail. Now we'll Only take a measure. I would measure this at home, but you can see here we have a tape measure we brought with us. I hung it on that same nail. I stretched out the line, and you can see it is, there's that knot. You can see how long it is. Now, this tree has a circumference of 15 feet around. And uh, not many trees around here. There are some big trees around here. That's why this tree kind of loses perspective. But 15 feet around. Do you have any trees by you that big? Now, this tree here is the uh, example of a multi-trunk tree. You can see here it has like a split trunk. And uh, these are very common around here, but they don't go too high up. So nothing like that mammoth tree back there that uh, we just measured. So we usually didn't, we discarded these from the contest. Now, when I was a kid, my grandfather would take me down here, we'd dig sandworms and then go fishing for flounders. At the time, you could, <laughs> well, you could eat the fish, I guess, at the time. This is the Long Island Sound. Over there is uh, Manhattan. Over here is the Bronx. And uh, you can see over here, this is uh, low tide. This is the jetty over here. We used to call the jetty, and that's where we would uh, fish from for... Uh, you know, but as a kid growing up here, I'd be searching over here, especially at low tide, looking for anything that kind of washed up or any kind of old stuff. And it's uh, and that's where I launched my kayak from, and then go over to the Bronx and kayak. OK, 
Okay, uh, next up, uh, last week we did a quick field expedient whipping on some rope because I didn't want to get into it. And I was accused of being a land lover. Uh, they said, what kind of scout leader am I for not doing a proper whipping? So, you know, you want to talk proper whipping? Uh, let's get, let's talk about proper whipping. Now, many whipping. times when I go to steam engine shows and things like that, I'll buy a hank of rope like this. It's usually black or real dirty and I'll come home and I'll wash it. And then I will uh, dry it, and then I will just hang it up for some kind of a use, depending on what it's going to be. You know, obviously, this is a an older manila rope, and I wouldn't use this for any kind of a heavy lifting, but it's still, it's a, uh, it's a good rope to have around the house. Now, this is probably the most, the uh, worst type of end security I've ever seen on a rope, you know. But what it is, is they just tied it in a quick knot so that it doesn't unravel anymore. Uh, it's acceptable uh, when there's nothing else available. But what we're going to do is we're going to do a proper thread whipping on here. Now, well, there's different types of threads that you can use. There's actually whipping line that you're going to use. And I'm going to use something that's very close to whipping line. It's a wax line I use for leather work. Let me show you that. Now, this is the line I'll be using for whipping today. And you can see it's a waxed line. I use this for stitching leather. This stuff is very expensive. Um, and what you could see it's made of, it's a, a regular twisted line here, you could see there, and it's wax coated so that it's not affected by moisture or anything, and it's, uh, it's very good, and it will hold the knot. So let's, uh, let's what we're going to do is going to wrap a piece of uh, tape. This is a painter's tape, so it's not too sticky. And we're going to wrap it up. We're going to cut up about uh, two inches from that line because this is all waste here. But uh, you can see what a nice job this does, right? Now what we're going to do is I'm going to show you the regular whipping, common whipping on this Very end. Simply for the common whip, we're going to fold a piece of line. This is whipping line back like this on itself here. And uh, then we're going to squeeze it down. This is where we're going to want the whipping to end over here before this. We just taped that up there. And we're going to squeeze this down with our, our thumb. And we're going to wrap it around this way and work our way up to the front, up to the top of the, the tip of the line. satisfied with the amount of whipping you have you want it to be at least the diameter of the rope you can go one and a half times the diameter and that's uh, usually the standard then what you do on your last wrap is you pass your your working end through here through that loop you see we just passed it through and now we're going to pull over here we're going to pull this loose end and you can see what happens it's going to tighten up you see how it's pulling that edge over here it's going to pull it and you're going to pull it under the rope like this okay just about half then you're going to take both ends pull it taut towards each other so it's a nice tight and then we're going to trim these two lines off now that is your common whip now to you would cut off an excess you want to leave just a little bit past about a quarter of an inch or so past the whipping so that it frays out a little bit and it'll stop it from uh, going any further we do it again with this Great handy cut, okay, and there is a properly whipped line. That's a common. Now let me show you sailmaker's whipping. Now to do a sailmaker's whipping, uh, what we do is we untwist the rope, opening it up a little bit, and then we take uh, our uh, whipping line and we pass it around this furthest leg over here, and you can see, and we leave a loop. And then we uh, twist it back together so that the rope lays the way it was before. Okay, there we go, just like that. And then what we'll do is we'll start wrapping it around. And you have to make sure this is long enough for these legs to pass under. And we'll wrap it around. Now that you wrapped your line as, uh, as, as much as you want, now you see how we uh, put it around this leg here? We follow that leg over here. That's this one here. And we're going to pull this around here and around that leg. And we're going to wrap it around there. Let me show you what that Okay, means. you see we uh, put this loop around this one leg that was here. Now we're going to pull this line here to, like that to tighten it up. And you see what's happening? It's tightening up around there. Oh, how nice is that? Now what we're going to do is we're going to turn this around like this and we're going to bring this line up here and uh, this one around i'll show you what that looks okay, like okay you see we have these two diagonals now you're going to take this one leg here you're going to wrap this leg around here like this and then you're going to bring this one up here 
and that'll be a third. And we're going to tie a square knot or a reef knot right in between the crack of that rope there, right there. Sorry if I was off camera. Now you can see what we did by tying that knot in between the, the strands of rope. You could see here each one of those legs has a, a twist around it. And what's so nice is that that can't come loose. Now again, we trim this down about a, well, a little bit over a quarter of an inch. Okay. Now, there we go. Look at that. Is that not a beautiful, beautiful salesman? Uh, sailmakers whipping absolutely beautiful isn't it that's the one i like but it's a little bit longer now there were much better videos out there that how to do the uh, sailmakers uh whip but uh you know <laughs> i have to concentrate a lot when i'm doing it because i don't do it all the time so that's why i kind of lose that uh brain mouth uh coordination so uh, bear with okay, me last that. up, our friend Ben Kerfee, who's a tool addict on YouTube. He's having a great time with his channel, a lot of fun, a great channel. Go check him out. But he sent this screwdriver in a while ago, and this one's in, in nice shape, but it just needs a little bit of work, and you see it's a little scratched up. You can see the end here, right? You can see it's kind of scratched. It's got nicks and dings. Uh, it's got engraving on here, HH. Um, let's see if we can't do something to get this, uh, this is made in Germany, I've never, West Germany, so you can see it's dated, and I've never seen anything like this before, let's see what we can do, have some fun. Here we are after most of our scraping, you know, there was a lot of little scratches and things like that. And you just scrape it out like these seams here. And you just drag your utility knife blade over here. And you can see it it, it does scrape up. But you got to go very careful because, you know, you just want to get that seam. And, and this is okay because now you're going to take this out with the wet sanding. And we're going to use the wet sanding pads that we used before for plastic. Uh, and uh, again, you just, you know, lightly scrape these off. And we got the initials off up here. And uh, now we're just going to uh, sand it. And we got the paint off here. These are the Let's wet go. sanding pads we used before. You know, it goes from coarse all the way down to super fine. And then we'll hit it with some polish. But right now, we're going to do this. This is mostly a hand operation. You really can't do anything with the belt sand or anything because the plastic will just burn up. So let's get okay, to it. Okay, as paint. you know, it's important for us to share our triumphs and also our failures because we all learn from each other's projects. And today was a bit of a failure let me show you what okay, happened Okay, so here was uh what we wound up with today now you see i did the inside here with a rust-oleum red you know and then uh you know what happened was i again i have that two-day turnaround so i don't have a lot of time and uh i sprayed it clear coated the the outside here and look it crazed do you see that crazing of the paint now, a crazing can happen two different ways. It can happen because A, because the paints weren't compatible, or B, because the one wasn't dry enough, and that's what happened here. This wasn't dry enough. So you could see what we were going for here. We were going for this red, you know, insert here, and uh, and then obviously the, uh, the clear coat that we did over here. Uh, and, and it did come out nice, right? I mean, the clear coat, and you could see here, we polished it through so you can see uh, but unfortunately, uh, this is what happens. You know, we screwed up the red by spraying over it. And, uh, so I got to sit on this, see what we want to do. And again, like I said, it feels nice. It's smooth and everything now and glossy clean. And so the clear coat's good, but just, I screwed up with the not waiting long enough for that red to, to dry properly. This is what happens when you rush things. I should know better. So in closing, uh, I screwed up, so you don't have to. Make sure you give whatever, whenever you're going to paint over another paint, you have to give it cure time. It's got to cure for at least eight hours, possibly 12. It depends on the humidity. And uh, don't make the mistake I did. Learn from it. And I want to say thanks again, Ben, for sending it over. We'll see. Uh, we'll give it a, some time to sink in, see what I want to do with it, if I can fix it up at all. And uh, thanks very much for tuning in. Hope you have a nice day. Take care now. Bye-bye. <laughs>